Hello, Wikibon community, and welcome to our 2017 predictions for the technology industry. Uh, we're very excited to be able to do this today. This is one of the first times that Wikibon has undertaken something like this. I've been here since 2000, since about April 2016, and it's certainly the first time that I've been part of a gathering like this with so many members of the Wikibon community. Today, I'm joined with Dave, or joined by Dave Vellante, uh, who is our co-CEO. So I'm the chief research officer here, and you can see me there on the left. At uh, This is from our being on the Cube at Big Data New York City this past September, and there's Dave on the right-hand side. Dave, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Welcome. So uh, there's a few things that we're going to do here. The first thing I want to note is that the uh, we got a couple of relatively simple webinar housekeeping issues. The first thing to note is that everyone is muted. Um, there is a Q&A option. Uh, you can hit the tab and a uh, window will pop up and you can ask questions there. So if you hear anything that requires an answer, something we haven't covered or you'd like to hear again, by all means, hit that window, ask a question, and we'll do our best to get back to you. Uh, if you're a Wikibon customer, we'll follow up with you shortly after the call to make sure you get your question answered. If, however, you want to chat with your uh, other members of the community or with either Dave or myself, you want to comment, then there's also a chat option. Uh, on some of the toolbars, it's listed under the More button. So if you go to the More button and you want to chat, you can probably find that there. Finally, we're also recording the webinar and we will turn this into a Wikibon deliverable for the overall community. So, very excited to be doing this. Now, Dave, one of the things that we note in this slide is that we have the cube in the lower left-hand corner. Why don't you take us through a little bit about uh, who we are and what we're doing? Okay, great. Thanks, Peter. So, um, I think many of you, or most of you know, SiliconANGLE Media Inc. is sort of the umbrella company, and underneath SiliconANGLE, we have three brands, the Wikibon, research brand, uh, which was started in the 2007 timeframe, and it's a community of IT practitioners. Uh, the Cube is, some people call it the ESPN of tech, we'll do 100 events this year, and we extensively use the Cube as a data gathering mechanism and a way to communicate to our community. Uh, we've got some you know, big shows coming up uh, pretty much every week, but of course we've got Amazon reInvent coming up, and uh, be in London, HPE Discover, and so you know we we cover the world and uh, and 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 cover technology, particularly in the enterprise. Uh, and then of course there's the Silicon Angle Publishing team, headed up by Rob Hof. Uh, it was founded by my co-CEO John Furrier and Rob Hof, former Business Week, is now leading that team. And um, so those are the three main brands. We got a new website coming out uh, this month on Silicon Angle, so really excited about that. And just thank the the community for all your feedback and participation. So Peter, back to you. Thanks, and Dave. So what you're gonna to hear today is what the analyst team here at Wikibon pull, has part, pulled together is for what we regard as some of the most interesting things that we think are gonna happen over the next few years. Wikibon has been known for looking at disruptive technologies. And so while we'll focus from a practical standpoint in 2017, we do go further out. What is the overarching theme? Well, the overarching theme of our research and our conversations with the community is very simple. It's put more data to work. The industry has developed incredible tools to gather data, to do analysis on data, to have applications use data and store data. I could go on with that list, but the data tends to be quite segmented and quite siloed to a particular application, a particular group, or a particular other activity. And the goal of digital business in very simple terms, is to find ways to turn that data into an asset so that it can be applied to other forms of work. That data could include customer data, operational data, financial data, virtually any data that we can imagine. And the number of sources that we're gonna have over the next few years are gonna be astronomical. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna find ways so that data can be read up, almost like energy in a physical sense, to dramatically improve the quality of the work that a firm produces, whether it's from an engagement standpoint or customer experience standpoint or agile operations, and increasingly automation. So that's the underlying theme. As we go through all of these predictions, that theme will come out and will reinforce that message 
during the course of the session. So how are we going to do this? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to have six predictions that focus in 2017. And those six predictions are going to answer crucial questions that we're getting from the community. The first one is, what's driving system architecture? Are there new use cases, new applications, new considerations that are going to influence not only how technology companies create the systems and the storage and the networking and the database and middleware and the applications, but also how users are going to evolve the way they think about investing. The second one is do microprocessor options matter? For 20 years now, we've pretty much focused on one limited class of microprocessors, the X386 or the X86 architecture. But will these new workloads drive opportunities or options for new, micro, uh, new microprocessors? We have to worry about that. Thirdly, all this data has to be stored somewhere. Uh, are we going to continue to store it limited in, in only on HDDs, or are other technologies going to come into vogue? Fourthly, in the 2017 timeframe, we see the cloud, a lot's happening, professional developers have flocked to it, enterprises are starting to move to it in a big way. What does it mean to code in the cloud? What kind of challenges are we going to face? Are they technological? Are they organizational, institutional? Are they sourcing? Related to that, obviously, is Amazon's had enormous momentum over the past few years. Do we expect that to continue? Is everybody else going to be continuing to play catch up? And the last question for 2017 that we think is going to be very important is this notion of big data complexity. Big data has promised big things, but quite frankly has, except in some limited cases, been a little bit underwhelming, as some would argue this last election showed. Now, we're going to move after those six predictions to 2022, where we'll have three predictions that we're going to focus on. One is, what is the new IT mandate? Is there a new IT mandate? Is it going to be the same old, same old, or is IT going to be asked to do new things? Secondly, when we think about Internet of Things and we think about augmented reality or virtual reality or some of these other new ways of engaging people, is that going to drive new classes of applications? And then finally, after years of investing heavily in mobile applications, in mobile websites, and any number of other things, and thinking that there was this tight linkage where mobile equal digital engagement, we're starting to see that maybe that's breaking. And we have to ask the question, is that all there is to digital engagement, or is there something else on the horizon that we're going to have to do? The last prediction, 2007, in 2027, we're going to take a stab here and say, will we all work for AI? So these are the questions that we hear frequently from our clients, from our community. These are the predictions we're going to attend to and address. If you have others, let us know. If there's other things you want us to focus on, let us know. But here's where we're starting. All right. So let's start with 2017. What's driving system architecture? Our prediction for 2017 regarding this is very simple. The IoT Edge use cases begin shaping decisions in system and application architecture. Now, the right-hand side, if you look at that chart, you can see a very, very important result of a piece of research that David Floyer recently did. And it shows IoT Edge option three-year costs from left to right, moving all the data into the cloud over a normal data communications telecommunications circuit, in the middle, moving that data into a central location, mainly using cellular network technologies, which have different performance and security attributes, and then finally, keeping 95% of the data at the edge, processing it locally. And you can see that the costs are overwhelmingly favoring being smarter about how we design these applications and keeping more of that data local. And in fact, we think that so long as data communications costs remain what they are, that there's going to be an irrevocable pressure to alter key application architectures and ways of thinking to keep more of that crossing at the edge. The first point to note here is it means that data doesn't tend to move to the center as much as many are predicting, but rather the cloud moves to the edge. The reason for that is that data movement isn't free. That means we're going to have even more distributed, 
highly autonomous apps that nonetheless have to be managed in ways that sustain the, the firm's behavior in a branded, consistent way. And very importantly, because these apps are going to tend to be distributed and autonomous close to the data, it ultimately means that there's going to be a lot of operational technology players that impact the key decisions here that we're going to see made as we think about the new technologies that are going to be built by vendors and the new application architectures that are going to be deployed by users. So, Peter, let me just add to that. I think the key takeaway there is that you mentioned, and I just don't want it to get lost, is 95% of the data we're predicting will stay at the edge. That's a much larger figure than I've seen from you know, other firms or other commentary. Uh, and that's substantial. That's significant. It says it's not going to move. It's probably going to sit on flash, uh, and, and the analytics will be done at the edge, as opposed to this sort of first bar of being cloud only. That 95% figure has been debated. Uh, it's somewhat controversial, but that's where we are today. Just wanted to point that out. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Dave. And the one thing to note here that's very important is that this is partly driven by the cost of telecommunications or data communications, but there also are physical realities that have to be addressed. So physics, you know, you know, round trip times because of the speed of light, the need for greater autonomy and automation at the edge, OT and the decisions and the characteristics there, all of these will contribute strongly to this notion that the edge is increasingly going to drive application architectures and new technologies. So what are the, what's going to power those technologies? What's going to be behind those technologies? Let's start by looking at the CPUs. The microprocessor options matter. Well, our prediction is that evolution in workloads, edge, big data, which we would just for now put AI and machine learning and cognitive underneath many of those big data things, almost as application forms, creates an opening for new microprocessor technologies which are going to start grabbing market share from x86 servers in the next few years, 2 to 3% next year in 2017. And we can see a scenario where that number goes to double digits in the next three or four years easily. Now, these microprocessors are going to come from multiple sources, but the factors driving this are, first off, the unbelievable explosion in devices served that it's just going to require more processing power all over the place. Uh, and the processing power has to become much more cost effective and much more tuned specifically to serving those types of devices. Data volumes and data complexity is another reason. Consumer economics is clearly driving a lot of these factors, has been for a number of years, and it's going to continue to do so. That we will see new ARM-based processors and other and GPUs for big data apps which have the advantage of being also supported in many of the consumer applications out there driving this new trend. Now, the other two factors, Moore's Law is not out of room. We don't want to suggest that, but it's not the factor that it used to be. You can't, we can't presume that we're going to get double the performance out of a single class of technology every year or so, and that's going to remove any and all other types of microprocessors since. So there's just not as much headroom. There's going to be uh, opportunity now to drive at these new workloads with more specialized technology. And the final one is the legacy software issue is never going to go away. It's a big issue. It's going to remain a big issue. But these new workloads are going to create so much net new value in digital business settings, we believe, that it will moderate the degree to which legacy software keeps a hold on the server marketplace. So we expect a lot of ARM-based servers uh, that are lower cost, tuned and specialized, supporting different types of apps, a lot of significant opportunity for uh, GPUs, uh, for big data apps, which do a great job running those kinds of uh, graph-based data models, and a lot of room still for risk in prepackaged HCI solutions, which uh, we call single managed entities, uh, others call appliances. So we see a lot of room for new microprocessors in the marketplace over the next few years. I guess I'll, I'll add to that and I'll be brief just in the interest of time. <clears throat> the industry is marched to the cadence of Moore's Law for, as we know, many, many decades, and that's been the fundamental source of innovation. We see the innovation curve 
shifting and changing to become combinatorial, a combination of technologies. Peter mentioned GPU, certainly visualizations in there, AI, machine learning, deep learning, sort of graph databases, uh, combining to be the fundamental driver of innovation going forward. So the answer here is yes, they matter. Workloads are obviously the key. Great, Dave. So let's go to the next one. We talked about CPUs. Well, now let's talk about HDDs and more broadly, storage. So the prediction is that anything in the data center that physically moves gets less useful and loses share of wallet. Now, clearly that includes tape, but now it's starting to include HDDs. In our, uh, in our overall uh, enterprise systems uh, the storage systems revenue forecast, which is going to be published very, very shortly, uh, we've identified that we think that the revenue attributable to HDD-based enterprise storage systems is going to drop over the next few years, while flash-based enterprise storage system revenue rises dramatically. Now, we're talking about storage system revenue here, Dave. We're not just talking about the HDDs themselves. The HDD market starts, continues to grow, perhaps not as fast, partly because even as the performance side of the HDD market starts to fade a bit, replaced by flash, that bulk, volume, part of the HDD marketplace starts to substitute for tape. So why is this happening? One of the main reasons it's happening is because the storage revenue, uh, the storage systems revenue is very strongly influenced by software. And those software revenues are in being bundled into the flash-based systems. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, first off, as we've predicted for quite some time, we do see a flash-only data center option on the horizon. It's coming well into focus. Number two is that the good news is flash-based products are starting to come down are, and are also in sight of HDD-based products at the performance level. But very importantly, and here's one of the key notions of the value of data and finding new ways to increase the use of data. Flash, our research shows, offers superior business value, superior business value too, precisely because you can make so many copies of it and have a single set of data serve so many different applications and so many users at scales that just aren't possible with traditional HDD-based enterprise storage systems. Now, this applies to labor too, Dave, doesn't it? Yeah, so a couple of points here. Yes, uh, labor being one of those sort of areas that Peter's talking about are, um, are, are in, in, in jeopardy. We see about $200 billion over the next 10 years shifting from what we often refer to as non-differentiated IT labor, you know, provisioning and, and you know, networking configuration and laying cable, et cetera, shifting from where it is today in services and or in on-prem on IT labor to vendor R&D or the cloud. So that's a very important point. I think I just wanted to add some color to what you were talking about before when you talked about HDD revenue continuing to grow. I think you were talking about specifically in the enterprise in this storage systems view. And then the other thing I wanna add is Peter referenced sort of the business value of, of Flash. As you, many of you know, David Floyer and Wikibon predicted very early on uh, the, the impact that Flash would have on, on spinning disk. And not only because of cost related to compression and deduplication, but also this notion that Peter's talking about of data sharing, the ability of development organizations to use the same data and minimize the number of copies. Now the thing to watch here, and kind of the wild card is the hyperscale model. Hyperscalers, as we know, are consuming many, many you know, exabytes and petabytes of, of data. They do things differently than is done in the enterprise. So that's something that we're watching very closely in terms of that model, uh, that model being the hyperscale model, how it mimics or, or how it doesn't mimic what traditionally has occurred in the enterprise and how that will affect adoption of both flash and spinning disk. But, as Peter said, we'll be releasing and, this data very shortly, and you'll be able to dig into it with us. And very importantly, Dave, in, in response to one of the comments in the uh, in the chat, uh, we're not talking about duplication of data everywhere. We're talking about the ability to provide logical and effective copies 
to single data sources so that you, just because you can just drive a lot more throughput. So that's the uh, HDD. Now let's turn to some of this notion of cloud or coding the cloud. What are we going to do with code in the cloud? Well, our prediction is that the new cloud development stack, which is centered on containers and APIs, matures rapidly. But institutional habits, habits in development constrain change. Now, why do we say that? I want to draw your attention to the graphic on the right-hand side. Now, this is what we think the mature or the maturing cloud development stack looks like. As you can see, it's a lot of notions of containers, a lot of notions of other types of technologies. We'll see APIs interspersed throughout here as a primary way of getting to some of these container-based application services, microservices, et cetera. But this same exact chart could be mapped back to SOA from you know, 10 years ago. And even from some of the distributed computing environments that were put forward 20 years ago. The challenge here is that a sizable percentage, and we're estimating about 80% of in-house development, is still set up to work the old way. And so long as development organizations are structured to build monolithic apps or take care of monolithic apps, they will tend to create monolithic apps with whatever technology is available to them. So while we see these stacks becoming more vogue and more in use, we may not see in 2017 shops being able to take full advantage of them precisely because the institutional work forms are going to change more slowly. Now, big data will partly contravene these habits. Uh, why? Because big data is going to require quite different development approaches because of the complexity associated of uh, analytic pipelines, building analytic pipelines, managing data, figuring out how to move things from here to there, et cetera. There's some very, very complex data movement that takes place within big data applications. And some of these new application services, like cognitive, et cetera, will require some new ways of thinking about how to do development. So there will be a contravening force here, which we'll get to shortly. But the last one is, ultimately, we think time-to-value metrics are going to be key. As KPIs move from project uh, cost and, prod and, and taking care of the money, et cetera, and move more towards speed, as Agile starts to assert itself, as organizations start to not only uh, con uh, build part of the development organization around Agile, but also Agile starts bleeding in other management locations like even finance, then we'll start to see these new technologies really start asserting themselves and having a big impact. So I, I would add to that this notion of the iron triangle being these embedded processes, which as we all know, people process technology, process the people in the process are the hardest to change. Um, I'm interested, Peter, in your thoughts, and you hear a lot about waterfall versus agile. Um, how will organizations, uh, sort of, how will that affect organizations in terms of their ability to adopt some of these, you know, new methodologies like agile and, and scrum? Well, the, uh, the, the thing we're saying is the technology is going to happen fast. The agile processes are being well adopted and, uh, and, and are being used certainly in the development. But I have had lots of conversations with CIOs, for example, over the last year and a half, two years ago, where they observe that they're having a very difficult time with reconciling the impedance mismatch between agile uh, development and non-agile budgeting. Uh, and so a lot of that still has to be worked out. It's going to be tied back to how we think about the value of data, to be sure. But ultimately, again, it comes back to this notion of people. If the, if the organization is not set up to fully take advantage of these new classes of technologies, if they're set up to deliver and maintain more monolithic applications, then that's what's going to tend to get built, and that's what's going to get tend, and that's what the organization is going to tend to have. And that's going to undermine uh, some of the new value propositions that these, uh, the, these uh, technologies put forward. Well, what about the cloud? What kind of momentum does Amazon have? And our prediction for 2017 is that Amazon's going to have yet another banner year, uh, but customers are going to start demanding a simplicity reset. Now, the Cube is going to be at Amazon reInvent with John Furrier and Stu Miniman are going to be up there, I believe, Dave. 
And uh, we're very excited. We're, there's a lot of buzz happening about reInvent. So follow us up there uh, through uh, the cube at reInvent. But what I've done on the right-hand side, this is actually the piece of Wikibon research. What we did is we went up and we did an analysis of all of the AWS cases put forward uh, on their website about how people are using AWS. And there's well over 650, uh, at least there were when we looked at it. And we looked at about two-thirds of them. And here's what we came up with. Uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 80% or so of those cases are tied back to firms that we might regard as professional uh, software delivery organizations, whether they're SaaS or business services or games, providing games or social networks. There's a smaller part piece of the pie that's dedicated to traditional enterprise high class customers. Now that's a growing and important piece and we're not diminishing it at all. But the broad array of this pie chart, folks are relatively able to hire the, the people and uh, apply the skills and devote the time necessary to learn some of the more complex 75 plus Amazon services that are now available. Uh, the other part of the marketplace, the part that's moving into Amazon, the promise of Amazon is that it's simple, it's straightforward, and it is, certainly more so than other options. But we anticipate that there will have to be a new type of, uh, even, and Amazon's going to have to work even harder to simplify it as it tries to uh, attract more of that enterprise crowd. It's true that the flexibility of Amazon is certainly spawning complexity. We expect to see new tools. In fact, there are new tools on the market from companies like Aptio, for example, uh, for, a, for handling and managing AWS billing and services. And that is, our CIOs are telling us, they're actually very helpful and very powerful in helping to manage those relationships. But the big issue here is that other folks like uh, VMware have done research to suggest that the average shop has two to three big cloud relationships. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to us. As we start adding hybrid cloud into this and the complexities of inter-cloud communication and inter-cloud orchestration start to become very real, that's, even, that's going to even add more complexity overall. So I'd add to that, so just in terms of Amazon momentum, uh, obviously, you know, those of you who follow what I read, uh, you know, I've been covering this for quite some time, but you know, to me, the marginal economics of Amazon's model continue to be increasingly attractive. You can see it in the operating profits. Amazon's um, gap operating profits are in the mid-20s, 25, 26%. Just to give you a sense, EMC was an incredibly profitable company, its gap, uh, operating profits are in the, 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 the teens. Uh, it's not, I'm Amazon's non-GAAP operating profits are in the 30%. So it's an incredibly profitable company. The more it grows, the more profitable it gets. Having said that, I think we agree with, with uh, I agree with what Peter's saying in terms of complexity. If you think about API creep in Amazon and different a proprietary APIs for each of the data services, whether it's Kinesis or EC2 or S3 or DynamoDB or EMR, et cetera. So the, 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 the data complexity and the, the complexity of the data pipeline is growing. And I think that opens the door for the on-prem folks to at least mimic the public cloud experience to a great degree, as, as great a degree as possible. And you're seeing people, certainly companies do that in their marketing and starting to do that in the solutions that they're delivering. So by no means are we saying Amazon takes over the world, despite you know the momentum. Uh, there's a window open uh, for those that can um, uh, mimic to the uh, large extent the public cloud capabilities. Yeah, very important point, Dave. And as we said earlier, we do expect to see the cloud move closer to the edge, and that includes on-prem, uh, in a managed way, as opposed to presuming that everything ends up in the cloud. Physics has something to say about that, as do uh, some of the costs of data movement. All right, so we got one more 2017 prediction, and you can probably guess what it is. Uh, we've spent a lot of years and have a pretty significant presence in big data, and we've been pretty aggressive about publishing what we think is going to happen in big data or what is happening in big data over the last year or so. One of the reasons why we think Amazon's momentum is going to increase is precisely because we think it's going to become a bigger target for big data. Why? Because big data complexity is a serious concern in many organizations today. 
Now, it's a serious concern because the bespoke nature of the tools that are out there, many of which are individually extremely good, means that shops are spending an enormous amount of time just managing the underlying technology and not as much time as they need to learning about how to solve big data problems, doing a great job of piloting applications, demonstrating to the business that the financial returns are there. Uh, so as a result of this bespoke big data tool aggregates, we get multi-source uh, from a lot and need to cobble it together from a lot of different technology sources, a lot of uncoordinated software and hardware updates that dramatically drive the cost of on-prem administration, a lot of conflicting commitments, both from the business as well as from the suppliers, and very, very complex contracts. And as a result of that, we think that that's been one of the primary reasons why there's been so many pilot failures and why big data has not taken off the way that it probably should have. We think, however, that in 2017, we're going to see, uh, and here's our prediction, we're going to see failure rates for big data pilots drop by 50% as big vendors, IBM, Microsoft, AWS, and Google, amongst the chief ones, and we'll see if Oracle gets into that list, bring prepackaged, problem-based analytic pipelines to market. And that's what we mean by this concept here of big data, single managed entities. The idea that we can pull together, a company can pull together uh, a vendor can pull together all the various elements necessary to provide the underlying infrastructure so that a shop can focus more time making sure that they understand the use case, they understand uh, how to go get the data necessary to, uh, to, to uh, serve that use case and understand how to pilot and deploy the application because the underlying hardware and, and, uh, and, and system software is uh, prepackaged and used. Now, we think that these the SMEs are going to be most successful will be ones that are not predicated only on more proprietary software, but utilize a lot of open source software. The ones that we see that are most successful today are, in fact, combining the prepackaging of technology with the availability or access to the enormous value that the open source market continues to build as it constructs new tools and delivers them uh, out for big data applications. Ultimately, you've seen this before, or you've heard this before from us, time to value becomes a focus. Similar to development, and we think that's one of the convergences that we have here. We think that big data apps uh, or app patterns are gonna start to solidify. George Gilbert's done some leading edge research on what some of those application patterns are going to be and how those application patterns are gonna drive analytic pipeline decisions and very important, the process of building out the business capabilities necessary to build out repeatable big data uh, services to the business. Now, very importantly, some of these app patterns are going to be, are gonna look like machine learning, cognitive, AI, in many respects, all of these are part of this use case to app trend that we see. So we think that big data is kind of an umbrella for all of those uh, different technology classes. There's gonna be a lot of marketing done that tries to differentiate machine learning, cognitive AI. Technically, there are some differences, but from our perspective, they're all part of the effort of trying to ensure that we can pull together the technology in a more simple way so they can be applied to complex business problems more easily. One more point I'll, I'll note, Dave, is that, and you were just at World of Watson, I'd love to get your comments on this, but the one of the more successful single managed entities out there is, in fact, Watson from IBM, and it's, uh, it's actually a set of services and not just a device that you buy. Yeah, so a couple comments there. Is one is you can see you can see the complexity in the market data, and we've been covering big data markets for a long time now. And there were two things that stood out when we started covering this. One is that software as a percentage of the total revenue is much lower than you would expect in in most markets, and that's because of the the open source contribution and the you know the, the multi year collapse that we've seen in, in in infrastructure software pricing, largely due to open source and, and cloud. Uh, the other piece of that is professional services, which have dominated spending within big data because of, of the complexity. Uh, I think 
you're right. When you look at what, what, what happened at World of Watson and you know, what IBM is trying to do and others and your prediction there, uh, putting together a full end-to-end -end data pipeline to do you know, ingest and data wrangling and collaboration between data scientists, data engineers, and application developers and data quality people and, and, and then bringing in the analytics piece. And, and essentially, you know, what, what many companies have done, and IBM included, they've cobbled together sets of tools and you know, they've, they've sort of layered on a way to interact with those tools. Uh, so the integration has still been slow in, in coming, but that's where the market is headed so that we actually can build commercial off-the-shelf applications. There's been a lack of those applications. I remember probably four years ago, Mike Olson at a Hadoop World predicted this will be the year of the big data app, and it, it still has not happened. So, and until it does, that complexity is, is going to reign. Yeah, and so it's, again, as we said earlier, we anticipate that the big data of the need for developers to become more a part of the big data ecosystem and the need for developers to get more value out of uh, some of the other new cloud stacks are going to come together and will reinforce each other uh, over the course of the next 24 to 36 months. So those are our 2017 predictions. Now let's take a look at our 2022 predictions, and we got three. The first one is we do think of new IT mandates on the horizon. Consistent with all these trends we've talked about, the idea of new ways of thinking about infrastructure and application architecture based on the realities of the edge, new ways of thinking about how application developers need to participate in the value creation activities of big data, new ways of organizing to try to take greater advantage of the new processes and new technologies for development. We think very strongly that IT organizations will organize work to generate greater value from data assets by engineering proximity of applications and data. What do we mean by that? Well, proximity can mean physical proximity, but it also is uh, something that we mean in terms of governance, tool similarity, infrastructure commonality. We think that over the next four to five years, we'll see a lot of effort to try to increase the proximity of not only uh, data assets from a data standpoint or the raw data, but also understanding from an infrastructure, governance, skill set, et cetera, standpoint. So that we can actually do a better job of, again, generating more work out of our data by finding new and interesting ways of weaving together systems of record, data, big analytics, IoT, and a lot of other new application forms that we see on the horizon, including one that I'll talk about in a second. Data value becomes a hot topic. We're going to have to do a better job as a community of talking about how data is valuable, how it creates value in the business, how it has to be applied or has to be thought of as a source of value in building out uh, uh, systems. We talked earlier about the notion of uh, people, process, and technology. Well, we have to add to that data. Data needs to be an asset that gets consumed as we think about how business changes. So data value is going to become a hot topic and something we're focused on as to what it means. We think, as Dave mentioned earlier, it's going to catalyze a lot of true private cloud solutions for legacy applications. Now, I know, Dave, you're going to want to talk about in a second what this might mean, for example, to things like the Amazon VMware uh, recent announcement. But it also means that strategic sourcing becomes reality. Uh, the idea of just going after the cheapest solution, the cost optimized solution, which, don't get me wrong, or don't get us wrong, is not going to go away. But it means that increasingly we're going to focus on new sourcing arrangements that facilitate creating greater proximity for those crucial assets that make our shop run. Okay, a couple of thoughts there, uh, uh, Peter. You know, there was a lot of talk a couple of years ago, and it's slowly beginning to happen, of bringing transaction and analytic systems together. Um, what that oftentimes means is somebody takes their mainframe and, uh, uh, for their transactions and sticks an Infinibite, Infiniband pipe into, a, into an exadata. I don't think that's what everybody envisioned when you started to sort of discuss that meme. Um, so that's sort of happening slowly, uh, and, but it's something that we're watching. This notion of data value um, and shifting from really a process economy to a data or, or an insight or, or, or an economy. 
uh, is something that's also occurring. You're seeing the emergence of the chief data officer. And our research shows that there are five things that chief data officer uh, must do to really get started. The first is to understand data value and how data contributes to the monetization of their company. Uh, uh, so not monetizing the data per se, and I think that's a, lot of, a mistake that a lot of people made early on is trying to figure out how to sell their data, but it's really to understand how data contributes to value to your organization. The second piece is how to you know, access that data, who gets access to that data, and what data sources you have. Uh, and the third is the quality and trust of that data. And those are sequential things that our research shows a chief data officer has to do. And then the other sort of parallel items are a relationship with the line of business and reskilling. And those are complicated uh, issues for most organizations to undertake and uh, something that's going to take you know many many years to play out the vast majority of customers that we talk to say they're data driven but not aren't necessarily data driven and so the one other thing I want to mention here Dave is that uh, we did some research for example on the uh, VMware Amazon relationship and the reason why we were positive on it is quite simple that it provides a path for VMware's uh, customers with their legacy applications running under VMware to move those applications and the data associated with those applications, if they choose to, closer to some of the new big data applications that are showing up in Amazon. So there's an example of this notion of making it more proximate, making applications and data more proximate based on physics, based on governance, based on overall uh, tooling and skilling, uh, and we anticipate that that's going to become a new design center for a lot of shops over the course of the next few years. Now, coming to this notion of a new design center, the next thing we want to note is that uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, plus augmented reality is going to have an impact on the marketplace. We've gotten very excited about IoT simply by thinking about the things, but our perspective is increasingly we have to, to recognize that people are going to be a, well, going to always be a major feature and perhaps the greatest value creating feature of systems. And augmented reality is going to emerge as a crucial actuator for the Internet of Things and people. And that's kind of what we mean, is that augmented reality becomes an actuator for people, as will chatbots and other types of technologies. Now, an actuator in an IoT, in an IoT sense is the devices or set of capabilities that take the results of models and actually turn that into a real-world behavior. So if we think about this virtuous cycle that we have on the right-hand side, the internet, these are the three capabilities that we think people or firms are going to have to build out. They're going to have to build out an internet of things and people that are capable of capturing data and turning analog data into digital data so that it can be moved into these big data applications, again, with machine learning and AI and cognitive set of being part of that or underneath that umbrella, so that from that data we can build more models, more insights, more software that then translates into what we're calling systems of an action, or systems of an action, not in action. Systems of an action. Businesses still serves customers, and these systems of an action are going to generate real-world outcomes from these models and insights. And those real-world outcomes will certainly be associated with things, but they will also be associated with human beings and people. And as a consequence of this, this we think is so powerful, it's going to be so important in the next, over the course of the next five years, that we anticipate that we will see a new set of disciplines focused on social discovery. Historically in this industry, we've been very focused on turning insights or discovery about physics into hardware. Well, over the next few years, and Dave mentioned moving from the process to some new economy, we're going to see an enormous investment in understanding the social dynamics of how people work together and turn that into software. Not just how accountants do things, but how customers and enterprises come together to make markets happen. And through that social discovery, create these systems of an action so that businesses can, can successfully, uh, can successfully uh, attend to uh, and deliver the promises and the uh, 
and, and uh, the predictions that they're making through their other parts of their big data applications. So, Peter, you've pointed out many times that the big change relative to processes in the in, in historically in the in the IT business, we've 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 known what the processes are. The technology was sort of unknown and, and mysterious. That's flipped. It's now really the process is the unknown piece. That's the mysterious part. The technology is pretty well understood. Uh, I think as it relates to what you're talking about here with, with IoT and, and AR, um, what people tell us, uh, the practitioners that are struggling with this, first of all, there's so much analog data <laughs> that, that people are trying to digitize. The other piece is there's, there's, there's a limited budget that folks have, and they're trying to figure out, all right, do I spend it on getting more data and, and will that improve my data, increase my observation space, or do I spend it on better models and improving my models and iterating? And that's a trade-off that people have to make. And of course the answer is, is both, but how those funds are allocated are, is something that, that organizations are really trying to better understand. There's a lot of trial and error going on um, because obviously more data, in theory anyway, means you can make better decisions, but it's that iteration of that model, that trial and error and constant improvement. Uh, and both of those take significant resources, and budgets are still tight. Very true, Dave. And in, and in fact, uh, George Gilbert's research with the community is starting to demonstrate that more of the value is going to come from the models as opposed to the raw data. We need the raw data to get to the models, but more of the value is going to come from the models. So that's where we think more people are going to focus their time and attention, is the value will be in the insights and the models. But to go back to your point, where do you put your money? Well, you got to run these pilots, you got to keep up with your competitors, you got to serve customers better, so you're going to have to build all these models, sometimes in a bespoke way. But George is publishing an enormous amount of research right now that's very valuable to a lot of our community members. It really shows how that pipeline, how those analytic pipelines, or the capabilities associated with those analytic pipelines, are starting to become better understood so that we can actually start getting experience and generating efficiencies and generating uh, a scale out of those analytic pipelines. And that's gonna be a major feature underlying this basic trend. Now, this notion of people is really crucial because as we think about the move to the internet of things and people, we have to ask ourselves, has Digital engagement really fully considered what it means to engage people throughout their customer journey. And the answer is no, it hasn't. We believe that by 2022, IT will be given greater responsibility for management of demand chains, working to unify customer journey designs and operations across all engagement functions. By engagement functions, we mean marketing, sales, we mean product. We mean service. We mean fulfillment. That doesn't mean that they all report to uh, IT. Don't mean that at all. But it means that IT is going to have to, again, find ways to apply data from all these different sources so that it can, in fact, simplify and unify and bring together consistent design and operations so that all of these functions can be successful and, and support reorganization if necessary. Uh, because the underlying systems provide that degree of unity and focus on customer success. Now, this is in strong opposition to the prediction made a few years ago that marketing was going to emerge as the be-all and end-all is going to spend more than IT. That was silly. It hasn't happened, and you'd have to redefine marketing very aggressively to see that actually happening. But when we think about this notion, putting more data to work, the first thing we know, and this is what all the digital natives have shown us, that data can transform a product into a service. That is the basis for a lot of the new business models we're talking about, a lot of these digital native business models and successes that they've had, and we think it's going to be a, pre a primary feature of the IT mandate to help business understand how data, more data can be put to work transforming products into services. It also means at a tactical level, that mobile applications have been way too focused on solving the seller's problem. We want to caution folks, don't presume that because your mobile application has gotten lost in some 
uh, online store somewhere, that, that means that digital engagement is a failure. No, it means that you have to focus digital engagement on providing value throughout the customer journey and not just from the problem to the solution where the transaction for money takes place. Too much mobile applications or too many mobile applications have been focused in a limited way on the marketer's problem within the business of trying to generate, uh, trying to generate awareness and demand. And it has to be, mobile has to be applied in a coherent and and comprehensive way across the entire journey. And ultimately, I hate to say this, but we think collaboration is going to make a comeback. The collaboration to serve customers. So that the business can collaborate better inside, but in support of serving customers. Major, major feature of what we think is going to happen over the course of the next couple of years. Well, I think the, the key point there is we, we all, there's many mobile apps that we love and, and utilize, but there are a lot that aren't so great. And, and the point that we've made to the, to the community quite often is that it used to be that the brands had all the power, they had all the information. There was an asymmetry of information. The, the customer, the consumer didn't really know much about pricing. The web obviously has leveled that playing field. And, and, and what many brands are trying to do is cre recreate that asymmetry uh, and maybe got over their skis a little bit before providing value to the customer. And I think your point is that to the extent that you can provide value to that, that customer, that, that information advantage will come back to you, but you can't start with that information advantage. Great point, Dave. But it also means that we need to, that IT needs to look at the entire journey and see transactions and discover, evaluate, buy, apply, use, and fix throughout this entire journey and find ways of designing systems that provide value to customers at all times and in all places. So the demand chain notion, which historically has been focused on trying to optimize the value that the buyer gets in the buy process at a cost-effective way, that notion of demand chain has to be applied to the entire uh, engagement life cycle. All right, so that's 2022. Well, let's take a crack at our big prediction for 2027. And so it's on a lot of people's minds. Will we all work for AI? There have been a lot of studies done over the course of the past year, year and a half that have been, uh, that have suggested that 47% of jobs are going to go away, for example. Uh, and that's not the high, that's not the only high end. There are actually folks that suggest much more over the next 10, 15 years. Um, now, if you take a look at the right hand side and you see a robot, think of now, you may not know this, but when, uh, when the thinker was actually, first, when Rodin first constructed the thinker, what he was envisioning was actually someone looking down into the seven levels of hell as described by Dante. And I think that a lot of people would agree that the notion of no work uh, is a hell for a lot of people. We don't think that that's going to happen in the same way that most folks do. We believe that AI technology advances will far outpace the social advances. Some tasks will be totally replaced, but most, most jobs will only be partially replaced. We have to draw a clear distinction between the idea that a job performs only this or that task as opposed to a job or an individual or an employee is part of a complex of community that ensures that a business is capable of serving customers. It doesn't mean we're not going to see more automation, but automation is going to focus mostly on replacing tasks. And to the degree that that task set for a particular job is replaced, then those jobs will be replaced. But ultimately, there's going to be a lot of social friction that, uh, that gates how fast this happens. And one, one of the key reasons for the social friction is something in behavioral economics that's known as loss avoidance. People are more afraid of losing something than they are of gaining something. And whether it's a union or whether it's regulations or any number of other factors, that's going to gate the rate at which this uh, notion that AI crushes employment uh, uh, occurs. AI will tend to complement, not substitute for labor. And that's been a feature of technology for years. Uh, it doesn't, again, mean that some tasks and some tasks set sort of closely aligned with jobs aren't replaced. There will be people put out of work as a consequence of this. 
But for the most part, you will see AI tend to complement, not fully substitute for most jobs. Now, this creates also a new design consideration. Uh, historically, as technologists, we've looked at what can be done with technology, and we've asked, can we do it? And if the answer is yes, we tend to go off and do it. And now we need to start asking ourselves, should we do it? And this is not just the moral imperative. But this has other implications as well. So, for example, uh, the remarkable, the remarkably bad impact that a lot of uh, uh, automated call centers have had on customer service from a customer experience standpoint. This has to become one of the features of how we think about bringing together in these systems of an action all the different functions that are responsible for serving a customer. Asking ourselves, well, we can do it from a technical standpoint, but should we do it from a customer experience, from a community relations, and even from a, uh, from a, a cultural imperative standpoint as we move forward? Okay, I'll be brief because we're wrapping up here. Well, first of all, machines have always replaced humans, um, and, but largely with physical ta tasks. Now we're seeing that occur with cognitive tasks. People are concerned, as Peter said. Uh, the middle class is obviously you know, under fire. The medium income, median income in the United States has dropped from $55,000 in 1999 to just above $50,000 today. So something's going on. And clearly, we're, you can look around and see whether it's at an airport with kiosks or billboards, um, you know, electronic machines and cognitive functions are, are replacing human functions. Having said that, we're sanguine because the the story I'll tell is the greatest chess player in the world is not a machine. When you know Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, what Gary Kasparov did is he started a competition to uh, collaborate with other you know human chess players with machines to beat the machine, and they succeeded at that. So this again, I come back to this combination of technologies, combinatorial technologies, are really what's going to drive the innovation curve. You know, over the next we think twenty to fifty years. Uh, so it's something that is far out there in terms of our predictions, but it's also something that is relevant to society and, uh, and obviously the technology industry. So thank you, everybody. So we have one more slide, and it's a conclusion slide. So let me hit these really quick. And, and before I do so, let me note that George, our big data analyst, is George Gilbert. George Gilbert, G-I-L-B-E-R-T. All right, so very quickly. Tech architecture question, leading edge IoT is going to have a major effect in how we think about architecture in the future. Microprocessor options, yep. New microprocessor options are going to have an impact in the marketplace. With our HTDDs, for the performance side of storage, flash is coming on strong. Code in the cloud, yes, the technologies are great, but development has to change its habits. Amazon momentum, absolutely going to continue. Big data complexity. It's bad, and we have to find ways to make it simpler so that we can focus more on the outcomes and the results as opposed to the infrastructure and the tooling. 2022, new IT mandate, drive the value of that data. Get more value out of your data. The Internet of Things and People is going to become the proper way of thinking about how the, these new systems of an action work, and we anticipate that demand chain management is going to be crucial to extending the idea of digital engagement. Will we all work for AI? Dave just mentioned, as we said, there's going to be dislocation, there's going to be tasks that are replaced, but not by 2027. All right, so thank you very much for your time today. Here's how you can contact Dave and myself. We will be publishing this, uh, the slides and this broadcast. Mickey Bond is going to deliver three coordinated uh, prediction stocks over the course of the next two days. So look for that. Uh, go up to Silicon Angle. We're up there a fair amount. Follow us on Twitter. And we want to thank you very much for uh, staying with us during the course uh, of this session. Have a great day.